Welcome to the wrap-up presented by Allstate. I'm your host, Scooby McGezzard, joined by my boy, Sam Ravich. And Sam, it has been a wild week, and I know everybody out in the YouTube comments has been seeing it as well. We are checking out the chat, and we will be listening and watching what you are saying. So join us in the show. Join us in the craziness, because we saw some great things today. Chaos. Yeah, chaos. It was great. Red River Rivalry lived up to the billing. So, uh... I mean, it was, it was just awesome to watch, and you and I watched it together. We loved it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got a lot of good stuff in store for y'all today. We got the best hands plays from the week that includes some things off the field. So <laughs> it, it's versatile yes. with our hands plays today. And we'll also be ranking our top 10 college football rivalries in history. So get to thinking in the chat what those are for you. And, of course, we got the best highlights from the day. We saw Georgia come back. Mm. We're seeing Louisville getting ready to pull off this upset and of course we got the Red River rivalry all those highlights coming up but first we're starting with the game of the day and here's a fun fact it's just the third time in their 119 meetings that each team is entering the matchup 5-0 Texas versus Oklahoma Quinn Ewers versus Dylan Gabriel third quarter Oklahoma up three Taylor Walker Ooh. says move get out the way two rushing touchdowns of the day 27-17 Sooners, fourth quarter. Longhorns wouldn't go away after a missed field goal from Oklahoma. Jonathan Brooks went MC Hammer. Yeah. No, 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 no. Can't touch this. 29-yard touchdown, 129 yards rushing on the yeah. day. After he had 200 last week, fast forward. After a three and out, Texas with a nice drive and a field goal, 47-yarder, and they take the lead with a minute 17. 22 seconds left in the game. Second and goal. Gabriel hits Nick Anderson. His first catch of the game. Oh, first and only. That's all that matters. 34-30, and you can see how much this means to the red shirt freshman from Texas. What a clean catch, too. Last chance for Texas in this one because they would get the ball as Ewers took them down the field. I don't know how he gets this off. I mean, that's just amazing. He even got it there. No dice. Ewers stows it up. No one comes down with it. Oklahoma wins a thriller. Gabriel with a massive performance. 285 yards and a touchdown through the air, including 113 yards rushing and a touchdown on the ground. Here's what he said after the game. Bay called me last night. He told me do whatever it takes. So you know what I'm saying? I, I'm all about OU football. I love this place. This is what college football is all about. Let's go. This is your first time playing in this game. Legends are made in this game. What should they say about Dylan Gabriel and your Sooners after this? I love my teammates. I love my team. That's always what I've been about, man. And God is good. God is good. Go enjoy this win, young man. Thank you. Mm. Just an absolute game. Dylan Gabriel definitely showed up today and quite frankly had his Heisman moment. I don't care what you call it because some people had Texas deemed as the number one team in the country, Sam. But with yeah. the performance today from Dylan Gabriel, do you consider him to at least get an invite to New York? I think he, he definitely booked his plane ticket to New York today. and uh, It was just impressive to see what he was able to do. We, I mean, his hand was bloodied in this game. Um, he, you know, he got pressured, but he was able to stick in. And these are the types of moments, and these moments build – and they accumulate, and what comes at the end of it is a Heisman Trophy. If he continues to do this, this was the biggest test for him. 398 yards today versus Texas is the most by a Sooner player versus the Longhorns in a single game all time. And let's not forget, too, that Oklahoma lost 49 to nothing to this team last year. And they did not have that man playing in this game. He was mm -hmm. out with concussion protocol. He said after the game to our, our, our friend Holly Rowe that this was the reason he came to Oklahoma was to play in this game. Absolutely. It's just amazing that, that he has the wherewithal in the sense to understand that this is not, not only just about me, but it's about our team, and this rivalry runs deep. And he was able to give Oklahoma and their fans a win that they will remember for a long, long time. And no doubt, I think we're going to have to see him in New York for the Heisman uh, Trophy presentation. Scoob. Now, now, the thing that impressed me the most about Dylan Gabriel is the way that he had control of this offense. For those that were paying attention, Oklahoma runs a very fast-paced type of offense. And when they're on the field, they tend to um, go 
quickly and try to keep the defensive linemen on the field. Mm -hmm. Texas came in the game with one of the best interior defensive linemen in the country, and they were deep. However, they couldn't get much substitutions in because Oklahoma is marching up and down the field, and they're not giving you much time at all to think. So when you got all that beef and all that body <laughs> that is going to have to stay on the field up and down, it's going to be difficult to rush the quarterback when you're fatigued. Now, three turnovers today, two interceptions, yep. one fumble, all came from Quinn Ewers, a minus three turnover margin. And um, another thing that this OU defense does is they are second in the nation in points off turnovers. Yeah. Over 60 points coming into the game off of turnovers. And Brett Venables has really managed to change the way that people view this Sooners defense because in the past it has been just as bad as it is in USC. And at yeah. USC, they're dealing with the same problems that Oklahoma <laughs> used to have, but you got a coach named Brett Venables that is a defensive-minded coach, right. and his focus on the defensive end has made a difference. I don't think anybody questioned whether Brent Venables could turn this defense around. I don't think that anybody thought it would be this quickly because this was an Oklahoma team that went six and seven last year and they were 121st in FBS in scoring defense like I and to go from what they were last year to putting up the display against a very good Texas defense and, and Texas offense this was just a great performance by Oklahoma um, and you look at their schedule again they, they put up some numbers here and they're going to continue they don't have a ranked team on their schedule the remainder of the way, but neither does Texas. And this looks like now Oklahoma with the inside track on the Big 12 title. Yeah, and, and I love that you said that right there. Let's remember that these two teams can meet again in the Big 12 mm -hmm. championship game. And it gets really spicy when you start to think about it because they could still both probably have an opportunity to make the CFP. Let's say Oklahoma runs the table. Texas runs the table. They meet in the Big 12 championship. Texas beats Oklahoma in the Big 12 championships thinly, the same way that Oklahoma won. Now, you look at it and you say both of these teams are really solid. So it's going to be interesting to see how this all wraps up. And for the Texas fans, yes, this was a disappointing loss and an incredible win for Oklahoma, but your super fan, Matthew McConaughey, uh, <laughs> looked cool, calm, and collective after, which should give you some, um, some comfort. Yeah, why not? Wow. That was a roller coaster right there, man. That was tough, man. Left him too much time on the clock at the end, didn't we? Hell of a game, man. Hats off to OU. Team came out on the front foot. Great emotional football they played. Well played, Sooners. See you next year. Till then, mean times and all times. Hook them. <laughs> Vibes. <laughs> Just like this highlight. Florida State taking on Virginia Tech. First quarter. Jordan Travis finds Johnny Wilson. His big body wide receiver. Ooh. Gets in there for six. FSU would add two points to make it 8-0 a little later. Travis finds Wilson with another one. Mm. He's boxing out the DB. They go up 22-0 at that point. We move to the third quarter now. FSU only up five. Trey Benson had himself yeah. a day. Seriously. If you see him in the forest fighting with a bear, don't help him. Help the bear. 11 carries. 200 yards rushing yeah. and just all day. Florida State goes up to win this one. 39-17 Benson. 18 yards a carry. And Florida State coming off the bye, Sam. Yeah. I think they sent a message. What do you think that message was to the rest of college football? Hey, pretty, pretty simple. Uh, we belong in the college football playoff. I mean, that, that was the message that Florida State sent today. They say, we will be in the top four come tomorrow. Because I think with the Texas loss, I think Florida State moves up into the top four, and that's where they belong. But I, I, I think, you know, look, th th this team has had some, some difficulties. The third down conversions were a problem the run game question marks were a problem. Both of those they answered today, but I think the bye week helped them a lot. 
Going back to last season, Florida State has scored 30-plus points in 11 straight games. It's the second longest active streak in FBS. Florida State is so good in the red zone, too, as well. They've scored touchdowns on over 80% of their red zone drives this year. The, the weapons that this team has on the outside with Johnny Wilson and Keon Coleman, the transfer from Michigan State, are so dangerous, and all they need is a quarterback to get them the ball, and they have that quarterback. Uh, it's just really, really cool to see what Florida State's been able to do this year, and I think they are deserving of top four. Yeah, they deserve that respect, and quite frankly, they're going to need LSU to keep yep. winning. Now uh, I'm taking a look at the chat. Uh, golden, um, no, goaded. I see you in there. What he said is, People were saying that Louisville is washed. (laughs) He said that Notre Dame is overrated. And quite frankly, I have nothing to say to you for that comment because what's going down. Yeah, it's going down. It's going down. So why don't we show y'all the highlight because we got some things that you're going to want to see from this game. Sam Hartman and Notre Dame taking on Louisville. We picked this up in the fourth quarter. Louisville up four. Jawar Jordan takes a carry, and he's gone. Touchdown, Louisville. It's mayhem in that beast. The mascot is fired up. Notre Dame fans, not so much. Jack Harlow, (laughs) he's feeling it too. Look at the kid. Louisville up 24-13. He said, I told you, fourth quarter. Hartman and Notre Dame looking to battle back. He didn't throw an interception coming Ooh. into this game. Sam, I predicted how many picks he would throw in the game. How many did I say, Sam? Two. Ooh, well, it looks like he threw two. That was Devin Neal on the pick. And this CFP playoff team is no more. Louisville wins it 33-20. to 20. He didn't just throw two interceptions. He threw three interceptions. Yeah. There were multi- three quarterbacks coming into this week. Um, it was Cam Ward, Sam Hartman, and Brady Cook. Yep. They had thrown multiple touchdowns and no interceptions. All of All them, them threw two-plus <laughs> interceptions. Yeah. Jack Plummer played himself a game. Louisville, 6-0 and oh in their coach's first year. Yeah. That's incredible when you think about what they are able to do. And we're going to talk about you now, Louisville. Well, welcome to <laughs> welcome to the discussion, Sam. Hey, hey, look, the ACC is wide open. This Louisville team has kind of lived by the big play uh, throughout the course of this season. They've kind of relied on the explosive play. It's either been all or nothing. That's kind of been the Louisville way. However, today what we saw was a lot more of the ground game from this uh, Louisville team. They were able to spread it out too on the outside, and most importantly, their defense showed up big time today against Sam Hartman with those three interceptions. This is a dangerous and sneaky Louisville team that I think a lot of people are now just starting to learn a little bit more about, Scoob, as we yeah, go down. especially defensively. They got to Sam Hartman quite a bit in this one. Um, See, he's been sacked five times in the past two games, and Louisville was able to get to him a lot. Uh, I look at what Louisville has been able to do this season, and I brought this up multiple times in some of our other shows. They put up a 50-burger on Boston College, and you saw what they could do offensively. And then against NC State, they put out one of their best defensive performances after being down 10-0 heading into the second half and then just balled out of control. So we're finding out who Louisville is. Yeah. We also found out who Georgia really is. Who they should be. Because they took on Kentucky, and everyone was talking about how this Georgia team is the number one team. Well, let's let's see if it happens. Mm. Carson Beck takes a handoff and a shot, and he finds his boy, Rara Thomas, gets in there, Georgia up. 14-0, 14-0, making this incredible grab. All in the first quarter here, Scoob. That's important. Yes. Second quarter. Wait, they want to review it? We're going to give you a replay because this play is that good. Four minutes. No, we go to Robert Thomas now in the second quarter. Carson Beck. Off mm. Play action to Oscar Delp. Three touchdowns for Georgia. Yeah. From Beck to start the game, 21-0, late in the third. Beck finds a man, Sam, who you think is a Heisman contender. Should be. I mean, without Brock Bowers, they weren't getting out of Jordan-Hare Stadium last uh, week with a win. And here he is helping them out in this one. 
Yeah, and I have to have you help me out to that highlight because I know where I was for a second. But Georgia <laughs> Cougars to a 51 to 13 victory. Carson Beck 21 for 27 with 307 yards and three touchdowns. That was in the first half. Those stats over the game were larger. Yeah. Georgia puts up a 50 burger in a game where people deemed, thought they were going to lose. Um, I think it's time we show Georgia some respect. And rightfully so, they weren't getting it. Now, but we weren't disrespecting you because you didn't deserve it. You just weren't playing to your they potential. Sh- they hadn't showed us anything yet. I mean, you, you made the point earlier on the college football show that they, they were not deserving of being the number one team. Now, I, I would maybe put up a stiffer argument now that they do after they uh, took down their stiffest competition to date in Kentucky and they handled them, handled their business well. But, yeah, your point's well taken. Look, Scoob, they, Georgia had scored only 17 first quarter points the entire season in all their games combined. They scored 14 first quarter points in this game alone. It just looked like Georgia was like, this is who we are. Like, this was the coming out party. We are Georgia. Don't forget that. We have now won 23 games in a row. Like, we are still the best team in the entire country. And I think this was a statement day, not only for Georgia. It was a statement day for Florida State. It was a statement day for Oklahoma to say, look, like, we are these We are these teams. Yeah. We're that good. Yeah. Like, this felt like a statement Saturday. And, and, and Matt Sims said this on our other show, the college football show, that uh, Georgia had found something offensively last week when they basically did what NBA teams do when they say to their best player, we need a bucket, go get us right, a bucket, and right. feed Brock Bowers as much as possible. They found that and said, you know what, maybe we should just do this all season long. And their passing game has completely opened up. Carson Beck had himself a day, a career day. And then Brock Bowers, three straight games with over 100 yards receiving. Uh, he's the first Georgia player to do that in the last 20 years. Since 02. Yeah, since uh, Terrence Edwards in 2002. It's been impressive to see what Georgia's been able to do. And look, I, I think we have to give Georgia some credit here because – they did not play well their first couple of weeks. They just didn't. And I give them credit that they were able to get through some of those difficult times. You're now in SEC play. It doesn't matter that they started slow. At the end of the day, Georgia's still undefeated. So, I mean, I think they're, they are deserving of that number one next to their name. And I think they're going to continue to play better throughout the course of this SEC season. Yeah, definitely, Sam. Now we go from the best team in college football to the best player in college football. USC Mm. is taking on Arizona and Noah Fafitu drops back to pass and he finds Jacob Cowing for the touchdown and the Wildcats take the lead 10-0. What's going on? We're still in the first quarter of this. Plenty of time for Caleb Williams and the Trojans to battle back but let's remember that Washington also had a struggle against Arizona. They beat them just by seven points. So Arizona is a better team than people may give them credit for. Sneaky good defense uh, for this Arizona team. They are stingy. But, uh, man, this is, this is some uh, dangerous territory here for USC at home tonight. It's time now for the good hands plays presented by Allstate. And Sam, this week, it's versatile. We got all different types of good hands plays. All different types, all different conferences, different levels. I mean, yeah, this is uh, this is a good little little bunching mm, here. Mm, wait till y'all see this. Up first, we head to Wisconsin. Gavin Wimsat gets picked off by mm. Ricardo Hallman, and there's nobody in front of him. Hallman, you got your team in good hands, my boy. Yeah. 94 yards to the house, seconds before halftime, Sam. Yeah, that's the, that's the crucial part about this. Good hands by Wisconsin here, but that cannot happen. I mean, this is seconds before the half. You're going in. This is a close game, and you give it away. Yeah, it was like 5-4-3. As he's still running, mm. Wisconsin wins it 24-13. Up next, staying in Wisconsin, Gavin Wimsett rolls to his left, and he hits oh! the photographer in the ouch. Yeah. Nah, he... Photographer's name was Ethan Bacon, and he got hit in the bacon bits. Yeah, Here's the POV yeah. <laughs> of Bacon filming this shot, and yeah, here's when the connection oh. happened. And we tried to connect with Ethan, asked him if he wanted to come on the show, but uh, he declined, which is all good. Uh, He's going to let this one sit. Uh, yeah, I'd be sitting for a while, too. All right, check this guy out, this FSU fan's body paint. Pretty terrifying. 
Um, his hands are are good because they're golden. Yeah, they, I don't know what's uh, going on here, but number one, how does that? How do, how do you come up with this idea? Yeah, this is a good idea. Let's just cover ourselves in glitter, like head to toe. Uh, and how do you do it? Uh, I, I mean, where do you? Get I have the so many. Glitter? I have more questions than answers. Yeah. Uh, up next, Ivy League. Check this out. Yale's Mason Tipton Whoa. makes a grab grab, and he lets the DB no no. That that's a no no. You can't hold me. That's a, that's a ridiculous pass, too. I mean, he put it only where his receiver could get it. Yeah, it's hard to track these type of balls. That's insane. And he just kind of leaned into it. Leaned back like Fat Joe. I like it. Next up, UTSA versus Temple. EJ Warner no way. hands it off. Flip back multiple <laughs> times. And throws it to John mm. Adams for six. My, oh, my. Take another look at this. Great play design. Flip twice. And Warner with the dagger to Adams. <laughs> Good hands all around. It's like both of the UTSA defenders were like, oops, we got to go back. <laughs> Check this one out. Houston Christian versus Nichols. Pat McQuaid. Oh! Throwing it to David Robinson Jr. And he says these hands <laughs> are rated E for everyone. Get out of here with that. And Come one. On, man. Get the and one. Come on, man. That's how you do it. Defender draped all over Robinson, and he still makes the grab. Ooh. Now, those are some good hands. <laughs> I told y'all we had yeah. versatility. Those were good ones. When it Scoot. comes down to hands, Sam. Yeah. And we're not done yet. How about this fun one? Uh, although Texas took the L this afternoon, they're in good hands because Matthew McConaughey, who lit up the Pat McAfee show, yeah was out there getting it. <laughs> Fourth and two. Come on, baby. This is the time. Hey, this is the dough. Get the yep. dough out. Oh, yeah. yep. We saw you Tricep. earlier. Tricep. Oh, yeah. Oh. Tricep. We're with you. Oh. We're with you. Horseshoe. Come on. We're this with is you. This is D-line stuff right here. Let's go. Let's go. Fourth and two. We're strong here. We're rocking. Time. Dropped an incomplete. And there we go. And turn it over. We got show and we got dough. Yes. Here we go. Now yes, we here we go. Now Momentum we change. Oh, sir. Let's turn the tide that the breeze change. The sun is out. Let's go, Horns. What a day we had out in Dallas with the Red River mm -hmm. rivalry. One that had me emotionally drained, quite frankly, Sam, because when the day was over with that game, I was like, wow. <sighs> I don't know if I can do it anymore. That was back and forth. I mean, we were we were both watching it together. and We were jumping out of our seats watching that game. It was wild. Back and forth action down there in Dallas. It was a great scene. No 100%. question. 100%. And th that got us thinking, what are the top 10 college football rivalries of all time? And Joey G and our wrap-up crew helped us put them together. Here's our list starting from 10 to 6. You see it. But nothing looks better. Then our top five, and in our top five, starting at number five is West Virginia versus Pitt. And we got Army, Navy, Oklahoma, Texas, mm. Auburn, Alabama, and Michigan, Ohio State. That's a good list. Sam. Yeah, that's a, good that list. a solid list. And then everybody up in the chat, let us know who you think should also make the list. But jumping back to number five, the yeah. backyard brawl, man. Every single year, that game has a lot of attention, even if the teams are good or not. No, it's it's great. And it's, you know, let me tell you this. I, I was able to broadcast the Backyard Brawl basketball game two years ago. It was electric in Pittsburgh there. The zoo is nuts. And every single sport, doesn't matter what it is, these two programs don't like each other. And it makes this rivalry so great. Just call up Pat McAfee. He'll tell you all about it. This has been a great rivalry for a long, long time, Scoop. And then at number four, we got Army versus Navy. Mm -hmm. That one is a lot of fun to watch as well because the cool thing about rivalries is just throw out the records, throw out anything else that you know about these teams. It is going to be a show. And then all the spectacle around this game as well yeah. is really what makes it special. You see the flyover. You see the festivities, the uniforms, everything. It truly makes the rivalry special. And then, of course, we got to see this one, um, the, the Red River rivalry yeah. at number three. But the Army versus Navy one was really interesting. And then the Red River rivalry had to go over it because, come on, why not? This has been going on for a long time, and every single year, it's a movie. This may have been one of the better renditions of this rivalry that we have seen, even though they have been really close. You mentioned it earlier, Scoob, that last year was a 49-0 win for Texas, Oklahoma, exercise.
some demons today. Yeah, great game. Quinn Ewers played fantastic, by the way. 19 straight completions at one point in the game. Just the few mistakes that he made were very costly. And then at number two, Auburn versus Alabama. I think <laughs> the play from this rivalry that people always remember is the kick six. Yeah. And year after year, these two teams go head to head, and it's fun to watch. There goes Davis. Yeah, Chris Davis had that 100-yard uh, return from his own end zone. That was the craziest thing I think I've ever seen on a football field. Oh, it's so fun to watch. <laughs> and Alabama is going to need that game yeah, this year. They will. The way that they're playing. Yeah. Um, uh, Daniel, Daniel's paid really well today. Yeah. Um, all right. And then number one, Michigan versus Ohio State. We know this one comes down to the playoff race. If, if you yeah. win, you're in. <laughs> if you don't, well, too bad. You're out. Yeah, this is, I mean, I, I, there, I go back to one uh, that I remember well. That's the 2016 game. That was JT Barrett leading that team uh, in overtime there. Ohio State won that 30-27. to 27. And that was one of the games I remember uh, watching in high school. But, I mean, every single year, you're right. This game pretty much decides the fate of a season for both of these programs. It's just good that it's not early in the season, I guess. Yeah, Ryan Day, you you, you better get that win <laughs> because uh, you got some trolls yeah. coming after you. They said you were fired up after Notre Dame, but you can't beat Michigan. I can't wait for that game. And then if you're a rival of Utah, top <laughs> high school recruits may – need you to step your game up because what they're doing for their scholarship players is different. different. I mean, how about a new pickup truck? Uh, I want you guys to know how much the alumni appreciate you guys and how much and how proud we are to be alumni. You guys really show the world exactly what it means to be a Utah man. And we appreciate you guys. Not only do you make us alumni proud, but you make this community proud. Where are you going so with this? Where are you going with this? the Crimson Collective and the collective donors and this community, they wanted to grant each and every one of you guys a brand new Dodge Ram truck. screen right here. It's a full iPad screen. <laughs> okay, full time fans, time for overtime brought to you by Modelo. And the Pac-12 has been on fire this season. And I'm looking at the group chat right now on YouTube, and people are going off about USC if they have a chance to make the playoffs or not. Something's wrong with my mic. I got is, you is, now. You're loud and clear my now. mic good? Yeah. I must have been sitting on it. But I'm good. So the Pac-12 has been on fire, and people in the chat yeah. are talking about USC and their chances to make the playoffs. And that got us thinking, because there's great teams in the Pac-12. Tons. Who are the leaders of the Pac? So let us play a game, because we also like the game Pac-Man. Who doesn't? Right? Pac-Man and yeah. leaders of the Pac. It's so a perfect. Who yeah, are perfect. they? And let me just start with Washington. Mm -hmm. And if you ask me if they're the leader of the Pac or not, Let's see if the game has any suggestion Let's of that see, for us. All right. Washington. Is he going to make it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. We, I agree that yes. they're leading in the pack. How yes. about you? We both agree leaders of the pack. I think people forgot, like, Washington returned 1,000, two 1,000 yard receivers from last year as well. Um, Michael Penix Jr. is a beast. The offense scores 46 points a game. And at the same time, too, they have a huge test coming up next week against Oregon. This is going to be a really, really fun weekend next weekend. College game day is going to be in town for that one as well. 
Yeah, so remember, if these teams are leaders of the pack, they will not be defeated by the right. Ghost. Yes. And if they are not leaders of the pack, they will be defeated by the Ghost. So our next one, Utah. Is Utah a leader of the pack? What are the Utes got? Ooh. Oh, yeah. You, you know what? I got to agree with this one. Utah is not a leader of the pack. Cam Rising, yeah. what is the word with him? Is he going to come back or not? And quite frankly, I think the, they had Utah ranked a little bit too high during the season because you still got to respect them as a team that went back to back for the Pac-12 championship, right? And you almost hold out the hope that Rising is going to be back, but he's not. Yeah, no question about it. I think Cam Rising is uh, the key to this team offensively. 21 points in the last two games for this Utah team. This is a different team when he is in there. But I do think that Utah is winning in the sense that all their scholarship players got got trucks. So, yeah. you know, at least that's a win. Your lead is in the pack for that. Right. All right. Now we go to Colorado. Question is, are they leaders of the pack or not? Mm, what are the buffs? What are the buffs got? Do you believe that? Leaders. Ooh, I I, quite that. frankly, I disagree with this one. This is my pick. This in, is my pick. In, in the sense of them not being a leader to win for the Pac-12, but Sam, I think they're a leader in the publicity. This could be cloud. interpreted a, a bunch of different ways here. I think they're leaders because, look, Dion keeps receipts now. Let's not forget. I think Colorado is a leader of the Pac because they single-handedly have flipped the college football world on its head. Right, It'll, the college football landscape will never be the same, thanks in large part to what Deion Sanders in Colorado has done. In my opinion, Colorado's already won. Like th th this is a win for them. They got a huge win tonight. I think they needed this game in order to stay bowl eligible, probably. So that was uh, that's a big win for them. I asked this question to everybody in the chat because I asked Sam yeah. this question before the show, and it was hard for him to answer it. Listen to me, if. If Shador Sanders, Travis Hunter, and Shiloh stay the big three. for next year, yeah. the big three, will Colorado be a playoff team? Now, there's a couple things to remember. Next year, we go to 12 playoff teams, right? And Texas and Oklahoma do not go out uh, – uh, Texas not stay and, do not the stay in the Big 12. They go to the SEC. So, those are two things to kind of keep in mind. Something here. to chew on right there. Yeah. All right, USC, are they leaders of the pack or not? Let's see here. Ooh. Ghost. Yes. This is also my pick, Scoob. So, yeah. I do not think that the uh, that USC are, are leaders of the pack. And here's why. We're kind of actually seeing it play out as we speak right now, where USC is out play, is not playing very well against an Arizona team. Uh, last year, they had one of the worst defenses in the country. We needed to see them improve and get better. We have not seen that. They still rank 63rd in the country in scoring defense. They have not gotten better enough to play against and beat some of the best teams in the country. So that is why I will say USC is not leaders of the packs. And they are struggling tonight. Now, Oregon. Oregon, are they leaders of the pack? Mm. Yeah. Have to be, right? I mean, I don't think there's any other way around it. Oregon's been one of the best teams in the country this entire year as well. With what Bo Nix has done, I think he's been in college for 25 years now. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be a great game next weekend. Uh, against this Washington team. But, yeah, Oregon and their defense as well. We saw what they did to Colorado as well. So, uh, really, uh, really solid stuff from Oregon there. Yeah, Oregon is one of my top four teams in college football, and they are most definitely leaders of the pack. Keep an eye out for them because Bo Nix is also having a great season. Okay, full-time fans, that was overtime brought to you by Modelo. And that is the show. We appreciate y'all for six. watching. Um, been a, a great season, and we're yeah. going to continue to have a great season. Thanks for watching the wrap-up presented by Allstate. Y'all have a good night.